You're listening to Tabletop Arcanum, a podcast dedicated to learning and exploring the hobby of tabletop gaming. Your hosts are Justin Taylor and Richard Geese, so sit back and relax as we talk, discuss, and joke our way through the hobby we love so much. Welcome to Tabletop Arcanum. We're your hosts, Justin and Ricky. And uh, Justin, you haven't been able to get rid of me. I've just been sleeping in this basement here. Huh? I know, but what's worse is we actually cleaned out some of the basement, so we found you. Yeah, no, that was actually kind of awkward. I was in the middle of, uh, you know, showering and. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah, you know, you guys gave me a little more room, a little, a little more birth there, uh, but. <laughs> But before we get into anything too serious, let's jump into our role recap. Justin, what have you been playing? You tell me. You tell me now. Right now, uh, I'm not playing anything. But I have, let's see, let's let's start from a couple weeks ago. The digital version of the Game of Thrones board game. Because they put oh. it out in a beta mode. And it's, it's like a one-to-one translation. The only downside I had was there's no, in a bot, in a bot, AI only game, there was no way to undo a, a mix misclick action. Mm-hmm. I could have won the game like in three different turns and three different types of actions if I had clicked the right thing. So it was like a little bit of you user interface issue, mm-hmm. but really good. And I, I'm really excited to see that come out because it's a faster um, digitally. Sadly, everybody's doing the the orders at the same time digitally. And you're just clicking your territory, telling it what order you want to throw in. So you're not, like, playing with tokens. You're not playing... It, it's a lot cleaner. Mm. The only thing that I think was a little weird was I think you could see almost everybody's power tokens at the same time. It's been a while since I played the physical board game. I think power tokens were hidden knowledge. If they weren't hidden knowledge, they became hidden knowledge during the bidding phases that you needed them for. I, that's the one thing I'm a little fuzzy on, but mm. either way, it's like, okay, I could see where everybody's at at any given time, whatever. And then it was uh, testing out Video Vortex, which was uh, put out by Mondo Gaming. Neat little deck builder, a dystopian future that's all themed on a old VHS rental store philosophy. Mm. So the dystopian gangs are based off of movie genres, like action and sci-fi and horror and comedy and it was like this neat little deck builder you're essentially attacking each other in it in a two-player game you're just kind of going back and forth wailing on each other with attack cards and up to four players can play and it's interesting because essentially you're trying to collect three uh, be kind rewind tokens and there's three unique tokens and as soon as you collect the three unique tokens from the other players you win so you may hit on the same person the entire time or you may choose a different target depending on the game state so i will i'm interested in seeing how it plays better with like more players mm. played a little bit of the mansky caper from uh, calliope games kind of a heist game you and your gang members are breaking into the boss's mansion while he's out to steal everything and then leave and then some point salad or point salad point salad so what about you uh, you know, I have been as exciting as ever. You know, there's always some Harry Potter in there. Yep. Uh, we've got the uh, Monopoly draw. But I did get some time with the Lord of the Rings adventure card game on Steam. Okay. So, so like, they're, they're, it's not quite the LCG mm-hmm. Hearthstone edition. Yeah, exactly. Where, yeah, I, I played with that when it came out, too. And it's neat. Yeah. And, you know, it was something that I got through um, Humble Bundle. So it was something mm. that was just, I had. And I was like, you know what? I really want to try it out. It was neat. With the changes with Day Digital, it's not getting the support that it needs. Yeah. Which is the only downside. It could be, if it was supported, mm-hmm. it could be really cool. Yeah. And I, I think that's where it's struggling now, is it was launched and then kind of like the rug was pulled out. Yeah. Uh, just like you just said, point salad. Yeah. Um, point salad, AEG, um, pick this up. I mean, you just threw it on the table today, too. Yeah. Nice, light, fun. Mm-hmm. So Quick. Very quick. That was a nice thing, too. We do have a wonderful uh, treat for everyone. It was definitely a treat for us. Yes. Um, we got to talk to Sandy Pearson of Pearson Games. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not familiar with him, you're about to realize that you know just about everything he's ever done. Um, so definitely take a listen. Have as much fun as we did during this. <laughs> First off, welcome and hi, Sandy. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. 
we're familiar with uh, who you are, everything you've done, the, the long laundry list of, of fantastic things. But if someone asks you who you are, what do you tell them just as a, a base? Well, I mean, like everyone else, it kind of depends on who's asking. But if it's a, uh, in a professional thing, I say I am a person whose only adult job ever has been a game designer. That's probably a really weird life, but I have nothing to compare it to. You know, except uh, except little odd jobs I had in college. I've worked in every field of the game industry: card games, board games, computer games, phone games. Gotten some degree of renown or notor- notoriety in it, and that's what I am—a game designer. Uh, and Sandy, most of your stuff has usually a mythos flair to it. So, where did your fascination with the Cthulhu mythos start? Uh, when I was a kid, I was one of those annoying, precocious kids that read a lot and, uh, and kind of spent time. I mean, I had friends, but I sat on myself. And so when I was eight years old, I was looking through a bunch of boxes in our basement, in our temporary house we were living in while we were building our, the ultimate house we were going to go to. And my dad was a big science fiction fan. So he, and he read all the old pulps from the 40s and 50s, and we had a lot of those around. So I'd go into the boxes to look for books to read because we didn't have them on shelves. And I found this book from 1942 called The Dunwich Horror and Other Stories by Lovecraft. And I thought, this looks interesting. I'll read this. And that was my first book of Lovecraft ever. And I was eight. So I didn't really understand everything that was going on in the stories, right? It was like, whoa, this is wild stuff. I had read Poe already, and I kind of understood that a little bit more. But then the, then the fascination probably started with the fact that it was impossible for me to find any other Lovecraft stories for, like, years. Also, I lost that book for three years. Then a friend brought it back and said I'd loaned it to him. And so I was looking for copies of these books I could buy. I couldn't find them. Finally, when I was 14 years old, I found that the local college library had the old the Arkham House books of Lovecraft. So that I could finally read all the stories that I'd read about in my in this Dunwich Horror book, because it had an introduction, a lengthy introduction all about the, the stories, and it named all kinds of stories that weren't in the damn book. So I was like, ah, I want to read these too. So I finally could. I, I checked them out of the library, I read them all, and then when when my time expired for the books, I returned and then checked them out again and read them all, and almost no one else ever checked them out. It was just me, you know, I could see at the back of the book. Well, after a couple, after a year or so of this, the college found out that these were first edition Arkham House books and they were valuable and they shouldn't let 15 year old kids check them out. So they got locked away. So I was once again deprived of Lovecraft. And then when I was 17, Ballantine came out with their little paperbacks of, of Lovecraft. And I was able to actually buy them by promising to do a billion chores for, to, with my dad. Or actually, I had a job. But I think I paid for it with chores. And at last, my quest was over. So there was nine years of trying to find Lovecraft and be interested in him, which probably raised him to a uh, like this esoteric quest in my head and uh, made me emotionally as well as intellectually attached to him. And then, of course, since 1980, he's been like the, the founder of the feast at my home. Like all my career is founded upon Lovecraft stuff. So, yeah, that's actually very fair. Uh, that's actually super interesting knowing that, like, you found it and then it was taken away from you lost in time and space equivalently (laughs) and and you couldn't just stop yeah and i didn't make i never met anyone else who knew about it you know i mean all my ever until i was like in my 20s every single person i knew who would heard about lovecraft or read about him had learned about him because of me because i'd introduced them (laughs) you know it was (laughs) like i knew intellectually there must be other people who found lovecraft on their own but maybe it's because i live in utah and no one there reads horror but (laughs) (laughs) Possibly. So with the, your your fascination with Lovecraft and the mythos in general and all the other writers that have contributed over the years to the mythos as a whole, is there a particular favorite old one or ancient one, depending on how you want to slice that, that uh, always has a special place in your heart? Well, it kind of morphs over time, but I'd probably say that nowadays, boringly, it's probably going to be Cthulhu. I think I can say that because I have a, a large original oil painting by Tom Sullivan of Cthulhu rising from the deep on the in my living room where somebody else would have a black velvet Elvis or a seascape. I guess <laughs> mine's a seascape. <laughs> of course. You know, and also pe- people when people get me gifts that they think are appropriate, it's like I got it like this paper cut out light box again of Cthulhu. So I keep getting Cthulhu things all the time. So I guess I, I'm. If I didn't like Cthulhu, I, I put myself in a bad position to avoid him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
he's he's kind of the most iconic of them. So it, it's, he's pretty it, iconic. As a kid, it was Yogg-Sothoth because the Cthul- word Cthulhu myth didn't exist, and right. Cthulhu was basically in one or two stories. Yogg-Sothoth was a lot more prominent. You know, Lovecraft himself didn't call it the Cthulhu mythos; he called it Yogg-Sothothery. But Cthulhu's the, Cthulhu's clearly the premier, most renowned one now, right? He's the one that's in memes and you know, right. cartoons and yeah. Right, they did a special episode of the Real Ghostbusters that had a minute. So, yes, by Larry uh, Dottilio, mm-hmm. a buddy of mine who uh, who called me when he wrote that script and said, "You got to see this. It's got Cthulhu in it." He wrote another story called Dairy Farmer: The Living Dead, and he had them be the Petersons, so it was me and my family, I guess. Oh, awesome! Oh. That's amazing. A little fun fact about uh, <laughs> all your connections there. <laughs> When it comes down to all the different mediums, you've gone from video games, tabletop RPGs, board games. Do you have um, any kind of difference in approach to designing games in those different mediums? Obviously, some of the pro- – I mean, the f- it depends on how much into detail you want to go. Fundamentally, my approach is to try to get a working version of the game going as early as possible and then play test the bejesus out of it again and again, constantly making changes as I go. And I le- actually learned that doing video games. But uh, that was what we did with Ensemble Studios. A lot, tons of testing with an early version of the game. And uh, I do that with the board games. Uh, tabletop RPGs, it's harder to do that because there's not like... Like with a board game, you can tell if something's unbalanced. But what's balance in a role-playing game? Because is it when the players win too much? I don't know. I mean, it's like... I guess it's if it's fun, right? So... I'm actually doing a tabletop role-playing game right now, so and it's the first one I've done since like 1987. So I'm kind of trying to get back in that. So I'm asking myself this very question: What should I be doing differently from a board game? So <laughs> it's on my mind a lot. Is there any medium? Do you like making board games, tabletop games, or um, video games? Which one do you have a preference of what you make? Uh, or? Well, I mean. I guess board games are tabletop. I really like making board games. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason I like this much more than making computer games is that with a computer game, I have to have a team of dozens. And it's really hard to get things to happen because I say, I need this change. And unless it's a change I can make personally, which sometimes it is, I have to wait for a programmer to log in some code. you know, And there's a delay. Or I have to wait for an artist to do an icon and sometimes i would do things like say well i'm going to take this guy and put and put an h over his head and that and also he's a hero and of course the program the artist hated that because it wasn't a real hero it was a guy with an h over his head but uh but with a board game i can do almost all the work myself may i do it's not all myself i do have an art i do have artists and i do have an assistant designer and stuff but i can get my get my project done a lot earlier and see it change in, in time and i really like that and uh, with tabletop RPGs, I'm gonna say that since this is since I haven't done them, they're the they're they're pretty much what I did for the first eight years of my career. But I haven't done them for a while. I'm just getting back into it, so I'm not. I guess I'm not yet ready to say if it's my favorite. But I like playing tabletop role playing games, and I've been ha- having a, a weekly campaign. I mean, for the last 50 years, so not the same campaign. The current campaign is like seven years old. <laughs> One before that was 14, so. I was just say, yeah, fifty-year-old campaign is uh, definitely something to be interested to talk about. Well, but for fifty years, I've been playing. That kind of leads right into what we were talking about next. Is uh, you you talk about that's a weekly session. Uh, what else have you been playing recently? Well, I I mean, I guess I shouldn't count like testing my own games as games I play, but I mean, I do tons of that. So that's probably the most common thing I do. I I recently played the uh, Yokohama game with my son and his wife. That was that was a fun game. Uh, I've been playing a little of my time at Porsche on Steam. I have on my iPhone. I have been playing uh, various puzzle games that probably are just like time wasters before I go to sleep at night. I've enjoyed um, uh, Secret Hitler. That's a pretty good game, I think. I also liked the game McJohnny's. It's like five or six minutes long, and everyone's like they're throwing counters at their chart and they're stacking cards and everyone's doing different tasks. Well, the guy in charge of the fast food thing is running rain. Anyway, that's kind of an interesting, fun game. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, Peterson Games as a whole. There's different studios, different designers out there. So, what would make a P- what would you say makes a Peterson game a Peterson game? I would say that a Peterson game first has a an exceptional amount of um, replayability in that every game there's some 
usually in a random element that makes it different every time, but it's, but but that, that players have to adjust to and figure out as during the course of the playing the game. There are typically many add-ons you can buy or not buy to affect the game. And I would say that they are all deeply steeped in theme. Usually when I design a game, one of the, some designers, when they do a game, they'll start with, like, if they're doing a strategy game with factions, which is not an uncommon thing, they'll often make, like, a vanilla faction. And then once that's perfected, they will then start making variations on it. Okay, I don't do that. I start with the theme originally. So the very first thing I did on Cthulhu Wars, for example, was to design the Great Cthulhu faction, then the Black Goat faction. I, and I tried to figure out what they'd be like from the very start and how they'd be different. So I never had a vanilla faction. And uh, and I think one result of one good result of that is it makes my factions seem really different. And one bad result is that it takes me a long time to play test them. You have the obsession with the mythos, and a lot of the Peterson game line have the mythos theme attached to it in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, it's kind of hard, um, right? It, right. I did but, the very first mythos game, so. But is there Call any? Yeah, but is in that line in your game line? Is there any non-mythos games, or at least ones that are maybe not so overtly mythos that still have those little hidden Easter eggs, if you will? Uh, yes. Uh, and in fact, I can give you two examples right now. One is the game Hyperspace, which is currently in production in China. And in Hyperspace, there's 25 different alien races, ranging from humans to all kinds of things. But five of the races are actually Lovecraft aliens. Not that the game's Lovecraftian. It's a space empire building game. Mm -hmm. But Lovecraft, most a lot of his creatures said, these are aliens from outer space. So I took them at his word, and they're there. So you can go off in your space battleship and fight a Cthulhu in space. Mm -hmm. It's it's only it's only it's, most of the civilizations aren't aren't Lovecraftian, but they're there too. So that's that. Another example is the Kickstarter campaign of Dinosaur 1944, based on all the comic books I read when I was a kid about army guys fighting dinosaurs. And of course, the game we play as a kid, army guys versus dinosaurs, right? Because that was like a common thing everyone played because everyone had dinosaurs and army men. And in that game, uh, to justify the existence of the dinosaurs, the backstory is that they stole time travel uh, technology from an ancient Lovecraftian race that lived here in the Mesozoic, which Lovecraft wrote about. And so there's some Lovecraft elements there. And then there's some secret bosses. And there are actually some of these Lovecraftian things coming back. That are, and they're just a boss. You know one can play them. But uh, So there's two examples. As another example, every game I did when I was working for the computer world, for, which I did for mm -hmm. 21 years, I'd sneak in a little reference to Lovecraft, sometimes very small, mm. you know, but if you played Quake, I got shoved Niggurath into that straight up and Dimensional Shamblers, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but then if you, but then if you played um, uh, Age of Empires 3, call it the New World, mm -hmm. I snuck in an Indian, tri you had Indian scouts to help you explore the world, and they come from a random bunch of tribes, and I snuck in the Miskatonic tribe. Which was, um, and I and I never, I just there. Sometimes you get a Miskatonic scout, and I actually had the other guys at the company. One of the other guys who knew a lot about Indians said, "What's this tribe? I don't recognize it." I said, "Oh, it's an obscure East Coast tribe." You probably, <laughs> you, know, you know, and I got away with it, you know, but it's there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, they're uh, obscure, uh, obscure northeastern tribe. <laughs> yeah, not many amazing. Massachusetts, you know. <laughs> yeah, so so I do try to sneak that kind of thing in. That's but, fantastic, uh, and like. I, I it was funny it's like I came up I grew up playing your games without even knowing I was playing your games it's <laughs> like you know it's like oh Age of Empires 2 yeah no I came across that when I was cleaning up my basement uh, last week so I, went, so, oh, I, man, so I got a funny story about Age of Empires 2 if you want to hear it if you're interested in that kind of thing so when I was so Age of Empires 2 of course after we finished Age of Empires 2 then Microsoft came to us and said now you must do an, an expansion for it an add an add on pack which we'd done for Age of Empires 1. I, I pushed it through in Age of 1, and it was a huge hit. So they they didn't want it originally, but then it sold so well, they were like, oh, now we have learned you after this. Yeah, we taught you. But anyway, so we, we're doing the Age of Empires 2 pack, and it's called The Conquerors, right? And it has it has the uh, the Huns, you know, and it has the Aztecs, and it has the Spanish, and it had the Mayans to give the Aztecs someone else to fight, you know, basically. And um, so we get, so Microsoft contacts us, and they say, you have to put the Koreans in the pack. And we were, we were done. We said, why do why would the Koreans? And they said, well, because uh, Star, StarCraft sold a million copies in Korea. And we said, oh, wow. that's really awesome for them. But I'd like to point out that, in fact, StarCraft doesn't have any Koreans in it. 
right? So that's not why it sold. And they said, but it sold a million, so you need to put Koreans in your game. We said, uh, uh, more power to the Koreans for actually not having been conquerors during the Middle Ages, so they don't really fit in our conquerors' pack. You know, they're a great civilization, we respect them, but, you know, I love Korean food. But they said, no, it sold a million copies. And no matter how much we argued <laughs> that, it made no sense. So the Koreans made it in. And then we, then we, then our, uh, our project manager, the, the Microsoft project manager in Korea almost got arrested for it because we made the mistake of calling the Sea of Japan in our map, the Sea of Japan, which it is known in every nation in the world except one, in which is a political problem to not call it the Sea of Korea. Right. <laughs> so, wow. That's <laughs> so that was kind of fun, too. That, that, yeah, I, I, I'm like I'm just kind of flabbergasted. Like, yeah, it makes sense, but like, yeah, no matter how many times you can argue it, how many times can you say no? That doesn't make sense. And yeah, it's like, writing the check and going. I, I, I guess Starcraft, we have to. I mean, I, I thought my argument was solid. Starcraft right. doesn't have a Korean Civ, therefore, yeah. that's not why they bought it. Right, they bought Starcraft because they like Starcraft, and yeah, they did. And I think still to this day, this uh, the Korean Starcraft community is still super strong. I would like to point out that my dad is the number one in his age group in playing StarCraft online. Oh, nice. But he's 92, so <laughs> he probably doesn't have a lot of competition. <laughs> but he still loves that science fiction. <laughs> right. You you were talking a little bit about uh, faction building, especially with Cthulhu Wars. And I, yeah. this is my next example is um, Cthulhu Wars is that super asymmetrical approach from all the factions. And you kind of already hinted at how you came up with this, but how do you keep content coming? Because we're on like onslaught three slash, you know, final onslaughts, kind of onslaught four. Kind so, of, yeah. You know, we kept getting more factions to a game. Well, we added one started with the fools bunch. last year, right? We added the cats. Right. So, yeah. So, well, how, so how do you keep coming up with that? as far as new factions in a game that's so asymmetrical already, but still keep everything relatively balanced to each other. I do it by steeping myself in the theme. Basically, I look at that and say, what, what, what should this faction have if it's everything that these guys are described as being in the stories, in the movies, if there are movies, in the, in the peripheral stuff, maybe not the fanfic, but, you know, everything that talks about this, this cult, what does it make it seem like? Because... And some of the work is then done for me because the authors and the artists and the people that have worked on it have tried to make it seem different from the other cults usually. So I take that stuff and try to give them abilities based on that. And then I throw it out on the game taming table and they say this cult sucks or this cult is way too good. And then and then the playtest process goes through. And as the playtest process goes through, my goal is always not to fix a problem by by imitating what some other faction does but to fix the problem by <coughs> having that faction do what it's supposed to be doing even better. Because one of the features of Cthulhu Wars is I try to make everyone feel like they are playing this horrible, unbalanced, broken civilization that is all powerful. And if they can just get all their ducks in a row, nothing can stand before them. And so I try to have that for all the civs. Having played enough Cthulhu Wars, I could say that pretty much the feeling the entire time. Everyone's kind of playing their own game, trying to win their own way. Yeah. But somehow you're all playing together still. Right. Well, it's true because, well, you're, you're playing it and you look at what, if you play a new Civ, you say, holy smokes, look what this guy can do. How could anyone beat me if I can only get that into action? And that's what I want to have all the Civs do. So, so it's actually, it gets more, more difficult over time because now I've used up a lot of the main forces that could be in Cthulhu Wars. So it's kind of like, well, I mean, now I don't have the resources to make a new faction out of, out of nowhere for this. So it's kind of, so that's kind of why we did the final onslaught, you know. There's a lot of people suggested that I do a human faction, but I can't think of a way to have the humans feel unbalanced and gross without violating the idea of being humans against Cthulhu, where they shouldn't feel unbalanced. So I'm not saying I can solve every problem. <laughs> well, and that's the problem being a squishy human when uh, the great old ones have tear, torn apart the world, right? Exactly. Right. You have to send waves after waves of your own men. <laughs> yes, but. <laughs> But yeah, but then the enemies themselves, they have waves of waves of their own men. And so yeah. it's, it's a little bit of a wash, sure unfortunately. Enough, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you touched on uh, Dinosaur 1944. Um, what's uh, what's some of the newest and uh, next editions coming out in uh, uh, the, the Peterson game lines? So the things coming out uh, fairly early that I'm excited for, obviously there's Hyperspace, which is going to be out there, which I've got a, a lot of people, which you can play on the Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia right now. So 
I've got a lot of people have been very excited about that. We just barely barely released, um, well, barely a few months ago, Planet Apocalypse, which has been mm-hmm. um, has a lot of critical praise. I watch, I read all the uh, the reviews, and I'm sad when they're bad. But I try, I put on a brave face, and then when they're good, like they have in Planet Apocalypse, they're just like, yes, they like me, they really like me, you know. <laughs> but uh, so Planet Apocalypse. So an upcoming game we have is called uh, Two Minute Dino Deal, which is a, a card game that literally is two minutes to play. As in, there's a timer that lasts two minutes, and you're done. I can see a little more than two minutes because yeah, then you have to add up the points. <laughs> but it's two minutes long, <laughs> so you get that coming out. We have some other small games, Mary the Monster, uh, in which you in which there's a giant monster called a Fahan, which has one eye, one arm, one leg, and so obviously there's going to be one of these, right? And mm-hmm. so it's running around the ta- running around the countryside, and everyone's trying to get it to come. Everyone's trying to pretend they have a bride for it. So he'll run to the bride to marry her, and as he runs there, he destroys everything in the way. So you're wrecking your opponent's towns. We have a, a game. Uh, that that called, sounds awesome. Yeah, we have a game <laughs> called the Seven Brothers, the Seven Golden Vampires, where the, mm-hmm. where the two players, one is vampires, one is is the seven Kung Fu brothers trying to beat them. I recently finished a game called Invasion of the Brood, which is a two-player game about the conquest of the Earth by an alien race, actually originally from uh, hyperspace, uh, of, of mind-controlling slugs. Dinosaur 1944 is currently up on the on the grid, getting ready to go. I'm just waiting for uh, our people in China to no longer all be sick so they can, we can produce things and, and uh, make these games, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Has that pushed anything back for you? Oh yeah. Uh, with other yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, hyperspace would be out now if it wasn't for the mm-hmm. for uh, you know the the virus. So mm-hmm. that's the same. And uh, oh yeah, and I got a game called Starship Captain, which are heavy duty playtest right now, which is uh, a uh, tactical spaceship combat game. It's in the hyperspace universe, but it's it's not a big strategy game. It's a tactical game with spaceships fighting, shooting blasters at each other, firing torpedoes. Every ship has its own secret weapon. It's kind of kind of a fun thing. Also available on tabletop simulator. Okay. Excellent. Like you're saying, uh, Planet Apocalypse just dropped. I've seen it in my local gaming stores already. My Kickstarter dropped uh, off at my doorstep not terribly long ago too. So uh, Planet Apocalypse. Planet Apocalypse. Have you have you looked at it yet? Uh, unfortunately, it's still sealed. Uh, <laughs> To be frankly honest with you, it's actually one uh, one of the things that we're looking to do is actually branch more into videos and getting some YouTube videos going. Uh-huh. So I'm working on getting the studio space, as you can see, kind of more set up for that. Uh, and Planet Apocalypse will probably be uh, a review and a uh, unboxing once I uh, can get to it. I think you will be appalled and impressed by the figures I've had. <laughs> you know, they're they're pretty bizarre. It's a very unique take on hell. Right. Which is it's awesome, right? Because it's yeah. you. You kind of had the the license to do whatever you wanted to do with that. Or I want to do. I didn't do it very conventionally. You know, it's a lot <laughs> more like it's a lot more like like, like Hieronymus Bosch than uh, Dante's Inferno. You know, but mm-hmm. uh, well, also uh, I one thing you may like is that I have had several people tell me that they thought it was the, and this is not from me, so I can say it, the, uh, one of the most in depth uh, co ops they've ever played. As okay. far as the times, the number of things you're worrying about at the same time, so that was cool. It's also really hard to beat, but that's I think that's good for a co-op. Yeah, I've always mm-hmm. I, I've I forget which uh, one of our recent episodes I was talking about co-op games in that sense of like wh- what win event, what win percentage do you really want in a co-op? And I'm always more of the I want to lose more than I win mm-hmm. uh, because it's a co-op game. We're putting all our heads together to try to beat the game it should be challenging most of the time. As well, soon as it stops being a challenge, I lose interest in the game. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the re- and, and because partly because of that, although the first time you play Planet Apocalypse, probably you'll lose anyway, but eventually you'll get good enough to beat the opening scenario. Mm-hmm. And then, then there's like, there's, you can rank up with, uh, with harder maps, harder bosses, different situations. This is one map, which is on the back of a giant hell dragon where you're trying to, right. <laughs> trying to defend his cathedral against the monsters of hell that want to take control. There's uh, there's a map where you're defending the mountain of purgatory from hell invading heaven, you know, and there's a map where you're defending Washington, D.C. That's, that's amazing. My, yeah, me and my girlfriend exclusively play co-op games because she doesn't like, uh, 
she doesn't like challenges or you know competitive nature in the household. It's um, I I have heard that before from people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you know, I'm not co-op, gonna... you can't lose. Or if you do lose, everyone lost, so there's no stigmata attached to you. Exactly. And we've played some co op games and she's like, This is just way too easy and then we play it a second time, she's like, Oh, oh, we just got lucky that first time. <laughs> and so it's nice to even have that that extra layer of being able to throw down harder maps and harder everything to keep going. Yeah. I mean if you get if you get the hell got the Hellhound pludge for Planet Apocalypse and there's ten different maps that ramp that get really tough at the end. And even the first one, like I said, the first time you play, you're probably going to lose. Now, we've beaten those final two maps, just not with the toughest boss. <laughs> so, so even you can't beat uh, your all ga- your your games in the uh, the the hard mode. All I will admit is that I haven't beat it yet. Not that I can't do it. Fair. <laughs> it's just a matter of time before uh, everything rolls up, uh, Sandy. I don't believe I knew that you had that much in your pipeline uh coming down the road like i knew some of it like i know hyperspace mm-hmm. is down there i know dinosaur for 1944 was, was just launched but uh that's a lot of different games coming through and a variety is actually the other big thing is like you've got quick two minute game to co-op game to something heavy to a <laughs> little bit of everything for everybody right yeah yeah i mean starship captain for example there's while well, there's not really co-op you can have teams where one team has their starships, the other team has their starships, and everyone's going at it like a fleet action. You want ideally everyone has their own starship because you have a little you have a little uh, a bridge display to control your ship with, you know, and operate it. So that's a like a comedy. That's a cross between co-op and you know every man for himself because you have a friend. Mm-hmm. We're all we're almost becoming a real company. I mean we we've kind <laughs> of hindered in the past that. We're actually a really small game company, but we kind of have the, when we did Cthulhu Wars, we kind of got the footprint in the market of a medium-sized company. Right. And people assume that we're bigger than we are, which, we're, I mean, we're 10 guys that don't even all live in the same state. We're minuscule. Well, I was going to say, that's, that seems to almost be, uh, unless you're like one of those really big uh, publishers, that seems to be where most developers sit is, you know, it's a team of six, it's a team of 10, it's a team of... So having an industry that is as lucrative and and vast and worldwide and reaching that it is, I think it's super interesting that I think you you said it earlier with uh, video games versus board games. There's 10 of you versus dozens of teams. Yeah. So everyone's a lot more tight knit, a lot, lot more collaboration. And I think a lot more uh, community built around it, too. I mean, there's still colossi out there, you know, mm-hmm. as oh, yeah. Wizards of the Coast um, and so forth that... Uh, and a lot of designers just work for those guys. Very fantastic. Well, all right. Well, Sandy, if there's anything else you want to say, floor is yours. Otherwise, I'm, I'm good. Thanks for the interview. I appreciate your time and effort and uh, energy with us. So <laughs> hope, to, hope to see you on a, at a convention sometime. Uh, oh, as soon yes. as they start going uh, conventions again, I will. I was hoping. Oh yeah, I was going to hit a lot this year. And... Last fall, I was going to be the real nice guy to my my team, and I said, "Okay, everyone." We usually go to uh, Germany for Essen. This is we're going to go to Essen in Germany. We're going to go to UK Games Expo. And so everyone in the team gets to pick one of those two things to go to so you can go to Europe and it'll be exciting. And everyone right. had to pick their guy and, and then they all get canceled. So. All right. Well, Sandy, once again, I appreciate your time and effort and uh, for our discussion today. It's been a lot of fun. And we're back. And we hope that you enjoyed that as much as we did. Uh, we definitely. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. We geeked out. Yeah. I just loved it. Thank you for listening. Next time we will be talking about Point Salad. Mm. Uh, we will be going into a little bit of a deep dive. It is a short game, but... I will be reviewing salads. Yeah. Never not thought I would be reviewing salads, but here we are. Strawberry Fields. Not bad. Almond. Not a fan of almond, so almond salad's not so good for me. With the right dressing, I think any salad can be val- can be saved. Fruit salad? <laughs> Potato salad. <laughs> Potato salad with a good old uh... balsamic vigorette <laughs> yeah. on it. Yeah, there mm. you go. Mm-mm, good. Just like Mama used to make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, joining us in our interview with Sandy. And uh, if you have any questions, concerns, want to talk to us, reach out. Uh, we are on the Twitter, the Instagram, and we're on the Facebook. Mm-hmm. All Tabletop Arcanum. Uh, we also have an email if you want to Write us a letter or hate mail. Ricky will eat, read the hate mail uh, personally. Yeah, and I take things uh, a little too seriously, so uh, tear me apart. It's true. Make me feel feelings. 
It's the only way he feels feelings anymore. That would be at uh, table, uh, tabletoparcanum at gmail.com. Keep it pretty nice and easy for everybody. So, once again, thank you for listening, and happy gaming! You've been listening to Tabletop Arcanum, hosted by Justin Taylor and Richard Geese, and featuring the original music by Paul Moore and Isaac Gilbert. You can follow us on most social media platforms. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave us a review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. As always, thanks for listening.